one of the most common questions I get on YouTube is about how, rightly dividing. Like, how do you rightly divide? How do you parse out, you know, what's true God, what's devil God, you know, especially in the reading of the Old Testament, because they are mingled together as one character 99.9% .9 of the time. And so when we read the Old Testament, it becomes a roadblock for many people to believe because they see that God appears to be half evil. And so how do we deal with that situation? And so that's what this teaching is about. And so we're specifically talking about rightly dividing using the concept of deductive reasoning. Okay, so what we want to talk about today. So we want to do a recap of the deductive reasoning process. So we talked about that last time. Then we want to apply those concepts and just look at a gen general perspective of true God's nature. And then we'll look at some, some evil passages and we'll rightly divide them. And we'll look at a page of scriptures from the curses of Deuteronomy 28. Um, and it says, thus says the Lord, I will rejoice to destroy you. Well, obviously that doesn't sound very much like Jesus or our father. So how are we going to deal with that? And then we'll look at another passage from the Old Testament where there was an enticement to sin, which led to a plague, which led to the death of 70,000 people. And um, and then we have many more examples we can get into in some future sessions. But I really want to just showcase this idea of using deductive reasoning. Okay, so let's do a recap. So we talked about this last time. So deductive reasoning is a logical approach to drawing conclusions from given premises. It involves making an inference based on a set of general statements or assumptions which are considered to be true to arrive at a specific conclusion. So in deductive reasoning, the conclusion is logically guaranteed to be true if the premises are true. This means that if the premises are true, the conclusion must also be true. For example, if we know that all humans are mortal and we know that Paul is a human, we can logically conclude that Paul is mortal. Okay, so in the same way, we could know various truths about God by looking at Jesus and the Gospels, by looking at his words, by looking at his actions. Um, we could, you know, get truths, you know, New Testament words of the Holy Spirit. So we can get a collection of known truths like scriptures that beyond a shadow of a doubt, we believe and know to be true. And then this becomes a measuring stick that we can draw logical conclusions about other passages that we read that we're questioning. Okay, so we know these three things about Jesus are true. And then one of those, you know, we have a topic and something in there is out of alignment with these truths then we would reject that as being true God because it's out of alignment with established truths. Or if we um, we have a set of truths that we know to be true and we have a topic in question and everything lines up correctly, then we would accept that and say, well, that's of the nature of God. OK, and so this this is how we do things. Uh, it's it's logical, it's biblical and and it works and it's it's true. OK, so let's just do some deductive reasoning about true God's nature. Okay, so we want to just stack layers of truth, okay? We want layers of truth, and then that's going to lead us to a set of conclusions about Father God. Okay, so we want to look at Jesus, and we're going to build a revelation about Jesus, and then we're going to carry over that revelation about Jesus, carry it over to Father God. Okay, so first of all, so how do you do this? Well, Jesus never changes. Okay, so he is the same, you know, the past, present, and the future, because Hebrews 13, 8 says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Okay, so that means that anything we learn about Jesus from the Gospels, that's going to be his nature at the time the Gospel was written. It's going to be the, his nature would be the same in the Old Testament. His nature would be the same in the future. His nature never changes. Okay, his nature never changes. So that's important. Okay, so there, therefore, we will say that Jesus is never a stealer or a killer or a destroyer, past, present, or future. He's never been and never will be a stealer, killer, or destroyer. Why? Well, because Jesus said that the thief, that's the devil, does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life 
and that they may have it more abundantly. Okay, so that means because of this first truth that we have, that means that the nature of Jesus in this scripture and the nature of the devil in this scripture um, are unchanging. So past, present, and future. The devil's the one who's responsible for stealing, for killing, and destroying. Jesus is responsible for life and life abundantly. Okay, and they don't switch roles. He's forevermore the same, forevermore. Yesterday, today, and forever. Okay? Then Luke 9.56. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Okay, so if you were to read more of the passage, basically they were going into a city of the Samaritans and the, the people of that village, they rejected Jesus. And so Jesus' disciples were like, well, do you want us to call down fire from heaven like Elijah did and consume them? And Jesus said, you do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Okay, so Jesus never changes. So Jesus is never, therefore, Jesus is never a destroyer of people's lives. He's never a killer. But on the contrary, he is always a savior. Past, present, and future, the nature of God, the nature of Jesus, is to save and never to destroy. Amen? Okay, well, let's, um, let's look at the area of healing. Okay, so Jesus never makes people sick. The devil does. Okay, so again, we're, we're using the word never because Jesus is the same past, present, and future. So because this scripture is true, anything that we learn about Jesus is true. It's going to be the same in the Old Testament, present tense, and in the future. Okay, so Acts 10.38 says, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Okay, so first of all, um, in the area of healing, people think that, you know, maybe it was Father God who was making people sick in the Old Testament and Jesus was coming behind Father God and he was healing them. That's insanity. Okay, so when you read this passage, it says how God, okay, this is God the Father, anointed Jesus, the Son of God, with the Holy Spirit and power. Okay, so it's Father, it's Son, and it's the Holy Spirit. So all three people of the Godhead, they're all acting in agreement. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all acting together to bring about healing. Amen? It's not Jesus working against Father. It's not Jesus undoing the wrath of Father God. It's not Jesus, you know, doing anything like that. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are absolutely in agreement. They're, they're operating together for the purpose of what? Healing all who were oppressed by the devil. Okay, so if somebody has a healing need, they have been oppressed by the devil. If somebody is sick, they are oppressed by the devil. If somebody has allergies, they're oppressed by the devil. If somebody is, um, you know, killed in a tornado or injured in a tornado, they have been oppressed by the devil, right? If somebody has a healing need of any kind whatsoever, guess what? They are oppressed by the devil. And Father and Son and Holy Spirit want these people to be healed. Amen? Okay, so we can say for all of time, past, present, and future, Jesus is never one who makes people sick or injured or anything like that. It's the devil. And we have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And they were operating in agreement. This is even in the Old Testament. Because when Jesus was walking around this earth, when Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit, it was the Old Covenant. It wasn't New Covenant. It was Old Covenant. You know, so he wasn't, it wasn't like... You know, there's this new dispensation and God's going to act differently in this new dispensation. No, God doesn't change. Okay, so that dispensation stuff, it's, it's, it's garbage. Okay, that's not the case. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were working in agreement in the Old Covenant. This was Old Covenant when this started. In the Old Covenant, Jesus is walking around healing people that were oppressed by the devil. Even though when you read the Old Testament, it gives God credit or blame for all sickness. But here it says the devil did it. Okay. Okay. Well, we also know about Jesus is he never kills. Okay. The power of death belongs to the devil and Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So he never has been a killer, never will be a killer. 
He's never killed anybody. The, the power of death does not belong to him. The power of death belongs to the devil. And Jesus was sent to this earth to destroy the devil who has the power of death. Okay, Hebrews 2.14 Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. Okay, so Jesus... Father God sent Jesus to this earth, and one of the purposes was to destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. And Jesus has the power of life. If you look at John 10.10, 10, he has the power of life. He likes to give life and life abundantly. He has the power of healing. So all Jesus' power is in the opposite direction as the devil's power. Jesus was sent to this earth to be the answer to death, to death, which is from the devil. Amen? The power of death belongs to the devil. So all any killing that ever takes place is by the power of the devil. Okay, so, so that's very important. Okay, so that means Jesus never has, um, you know, in the time of this writing, was not doing, and after, you know, into the future, he never will kill anybody. He doesn't have the power of death. He couldn't kill you. He doesn't want to kill you. He wants to give you life and life abundantly. And he does not possess the power or the ability to kill. He does not possess that. The devil does. Okay. All right. So now, so we have an idea about Jesus's character. But what about father? Like, because people will think, well, Jesus is the nice one and father's the mean one. You know, father has his righteous indignation. It has to be satisfied. And, and so they think that father's like half evil because he, he likes to orchestrate death and destruction. Um, and it specifically says things like that in the Old Testament. It, it doesn't say father. It says, you know, God or the Lord your God or Yahweh or Jehovah or something like that. Um, and, and so people read the Bible and they have an, they have a wrong understanding from what they read because they don't rightly divide. Okay. But, um, but anyway, Jesus is the exact image of father God. And so whatever we learn about Jesus, it exactly applies to Father. So if Jesus was busy doing certain things, those are things that Father likes to do. If there were things that Jesus did not do, those are things Father does not do. So Jesus is the exact image of Father God. So the best thing to do and the best advice we can give anybody, if you want to know the true nature of God, you go read the Gospels and just keep rereading and rereading and rereading the Gospels. Because Jesus in the Gospels is the ex the express image of God. He is the character of God personified. And so any questions about God's true nature can be answered just by looking at Jesus. Amen? The confusion comes when we look elsewhere. But if you look at Jesus, the confusion goes away. So everything we know about Jesus' character also applies to Father God. Um, and there's let's look at a couple scriptures that tell us that. So in Hebrews 1, 3, Jesus being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. So this passage is talking about Jesus and it's talking about Father. So Jesus is the express image of Father God's person. So he is the exact replica. He's the carbon copy. He's the exact image. So anything, any characteristic of Jesus also applies to Father. You know, so if, if you just sit there and think about it, uh, you know, how many people did Jesus kill? How many people did Jesus make sick? How many people did Jesus bring a curse upon? How many people did Jesus punish? How many people did Jesus bring trials and tribulations upon? You know, and so he, he didn't do any of those things ever. Amen. And so neither is father the one who does those things. You know, it's the devil who does those things. Okay, then you can look at the things Jesus was doing. Jesus was busy saving people. He was healing people. He was raising the dead. He was giving life. He was solving problems. He was helping them. And so that just as Jesus is, so is our Father. And so all the things he did, Father God does. And all the things he didn't do, neither does Father God do. Okay, and then we have another one, John 14, 7 to 9. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. 
Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, Show us the Father? He who has seen me has seen the Father. Okay, I'm telling you the easiest way to avoid doctrinal disputes or anything like that, arguments, if, if people are debating about the, the character and nature of God, it's to come to this realization that the image of Father is exactly like Jesus in the Gospels. That is the easiest way to, to tell somebody what's the nature of God. Amen? And then you have them go read the Gospels and take notes of all the good things Jesus was doing, and then take note of how many bad things he did. And so one list is empty, and the other one is a long list of good things. Amen? Okay, so, um, so let's draw using deductive reasoning. So we have all these truths, right? We have just layers of truth. Now, what conclusions can we draw about the nature of Father God by looking at these truths about Jesus? Okay, well, we can... We can conclude that Father God has never been and never will be a stealer, a killer, a destroyer, or a maker sicker, or a trial bringer, or anything like that. Okay, Father God is not responsible for sickness. The devil is. Um, you know, Father God is not responsible for sickness um, because you know it explicitly says the devil was responsible but he also he commissioned jesus to heal the sick he commissioned jesus to bring recovery of sight to the blind to heal the brokenhearted you know all those things he commissioned jesus to heal the sick by way of you know he anointed him with the holy spirit he anointed him with the miraculous power of god and then jesus used that and he went about healing all who were oppressed by the devil okay so father god is not working against his own purposes, but Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are working all together to accomplish the same good purpose, which is healing, which is protection, which is salvation, which is life-giving, and so forth. We can also conclude that Father is not a killer because he sent Jesus to destroy the devil who has the power of death. Jesus, Father, and Holy Spirit only possess the power of life and not the power of death. And then we can further conclude that Father God is not the one responsible for Yahweh's curses in the Old Testament because those curses involve sickness, stealing, killing, destroying, captivity, and just all kinds of manner of oppression. You know, so Jesus was sent by Father to set us free from oppression of the devil. He's not the author of oppression. He's not the author of curses. He's the answer to it. Amen? Okay, so this is how you use deductive reasoning. You just use truths, known inarguable truths and you use those to extend to evaluate situations and draw logical conclusions so that's how you rightly divide okay so why do we really need to do this well because somebody like me will come along so my first experience with god was that he was a healer you know i had um i was addicted to, to many different things and my first experience of God with God was that he instantly set me free from addiction and sinful nature and, you know, all kinds of problems, right? Just instantly, boom. And so I just knew that God was good. I knew that he was merciful and I knew that he was a healer and I knew how bad that I was. Okay. And so, you know, I started off in the New Testament. Things were, were going okay. And then I got in a Bible study that was focused on the Old Testament. And then I started reading the Old Testament and my faith in God and my love for him was wrecked um, when I read the Old Testament because I couldn't get past evil passages. So because I couldn't understand what to do with these these evil Old Testament passages, I did not like God anymore. You know, I he was mean. He was evil. He was hurting and harming and killing people. And so I couldn't I couldn't accept that. I wasn't willing to justify it. I wasn't willing to explain it away. I wasn't willing to ignore it. I was going to reject him or else I had to have answers. Okay. And there's bazillions of more people like me that have that, that problem. Okay. But thankfully, you know, God has, you know, given me uh, answers to those problems, right? Okay. So let's just read some passages in the Old Testament and then we'll apply some truth to it. And then we'll come away with some conclusions. Okay. So thus says the Lord, I will rejoice to destroy you. Okay, well, already that sounds wrong when you look at, um, you know, Jesus said, I did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. So we already know that's wrong just from that last page. 
Okay, so let's um, let's read from Deuteronomy 28. We'll have one verse from Proverbs, which kind of aligns. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your terror comes. Who wants a God that's going to laugh at you when you're having calamity or mock you and make fun of you when terror has come upon you? In Deuteronomy 28, 63, And it shall be that just as the Lord rejoiced over you to do you good and multiply you, so the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you and bring you to nothing, and you shall be plucked from off the land which you go to possess. It says that the Lord will rejoice to destroy you. But wait a minute. Jesus said, the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. So you can see it's a, it's a contradiction. The when you read the, the New Testament and then you read the Old Testament, there's contradiction. So anybody who said there's no contradiction in the Bible is a fool, and they've never read the Bible, or they're they're deceived or, or something strange is going on. Okay, The Bible is filled with contradictions, especially between the Old Testament and the New Testament. What are we going to do about it? Right? So I don't want a father who's rejoicing to destroy me. Okay, let's look at verse 20 to 22. The Lord will send on you cursing, confusion, and rebuke, and all that you set your hand to do until you are destroyed and until you perish quickly because of the wickedness of your doings in which you have forsaken me. The Lord will make the plague cling to you until he has consumed you from the land which you are going to possess. The Lord will strike you with consumption, with fever, with inflammation, with severe burning, with the sword, with scorching, with mildew. They shall pursue you until you perish. Okay, well, that doesn't line up with the nature of God we saw on the previous page. It's completely opposite. And in fact, on the previous page, it said that the devil was responsible for sickness. So the devil was stealing, killing, and destroying. Yet here you have God responsible for sickness and God responsible for stealing, killing, and destroying. So it doesn't add up. Okay, verse 27 and 28. The Lord will strike you with the boils of Egypt, with tumors, with, with the scab, and with the itch from which you cannot be healed. The Lord will strike you with madness and blindness and confusion of heart. Okay, all the same issues apply, right? Um, verse 32 and 41. Your sons and your daughters shall be given to another people, and your eyes shall look and fail with longing for them all day long, and there shall be no strength in your hand. You shall beget sons and daughters, but they shall not be yours, for they shall go into captivity. Okay, so now he's going to send your children, have them taken, um, have them be kidnapped. I mean, would Jesus ever have your children to be kidnapped? I don't think so. Okay, verse 35. The Lord will strike you in the knees and on the legs with severe boils, which cannot be healed. And from the sole of your foot to the top of your head. Okay, well, interestingly, okay, this is sickness, right? So in Acts 10, 38, we know the sickness is of the devil. But here it's saying the Lord is going to do it. Okay, well, what do you what do you see when you read the book of Job? Who... Who, who was it that was responsible for smiting Job with boils from the top of his head to the soles of his feet? It was the devil. Amen. And it specifically says so. But here it says the Lord's going to do it. Okay, we go to verses 53 and 61. Now this next set of passages is are the most evil passages in the Bible. Okay. And, and the Lord said he's the one who's doing this. Okay. So the most, the gravest evil you can find in the Bible is right here. And it's the Lord, Yahweh, Jehovah. He says, this is what he does. Okay. It, he's going to curse these people so bad that you shall eat the fruit of your own body, the flesh of your sons and your daughters, whom the Lord your God has given you in the siege and desperate straits in which your enemy shall distress you. The sensitive and very refined man among you will be hostile toward his brother, toward his, toward the wife of his bosom, and toward the rest of his children whom he leaves behind, so that he will not give any of them the flesh of his children whom he will eat, because he has nothing left in the siege. The tender and delicate woman will refuse to the husband of her bosom and to her son and her daughter her placenta, 
which comes out from between her feet, and her children whom she bears, for she will eat them secretly for lack of everything in the siege. Okay, and then, I mean, that's the most evil. Now here's some more evil, but not quite as evil. <laughs> if you do not carefully observe all the words of this law that are written in this book, that you may fear this glorious and awesome name, the Lord your God, Yahweh Elohim, then the Lord will bring upon you and your descendants extraordinary plagues, great and prolonged plagues, and serious and prolonged sicknesses. And moreover, he will bring back on you all the diseases of Egypt, of which you were afraid, and they shall cling to you. Also, every sickness and every plague, which is not written in this book of the law, will the Lord bring upon you until you are destroyed. It's like, whoa, what are we going to do about that? Like, this, this is not my God. I would not want a God like this. And I do not have a God like this. This is supreme evil. Especially, it doesn't get any more evil than this passage right here in orange. I mean, any any so-called deity that would curse you so bad that you eat your own children is supreme evil. Okay? So, what do we do? Well, we need to, we need to apply the deductive reasoning process, which is, we take a set of known truths and we apply it to the situation and then we draw a conclusion. And if these truths are true, then the conclusion is guaranteed to be true also. Okay, well, let's look at these truths. How does, how does Jesus feel about curse coming upon people? Okay, how does he feel about that? Okay, well, he was coming up on Jerusalem, and he was thinking about all the terrible stuff that was going to happen to them, such as things like you're seeing here and all these curses. He was thinking about that, and this is his reaction. Now, as he drew near Jerusalem, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace. Okay, and then he went on to describe that they were going to be sieged by enemies and woe to nursing mothers and babies in that time. You know, so terrible things were going to happen. Things like we just read. So Jesus isn't laughing about this curse that's going to come up, come upon them. And Jesus is not rejoicing that they're going to be destroyed with this curse. Jesus is crying. Jesus is crying for Jerusalem because he knows the tragedy that's going to come upon them. He's not responsible for it. He's not laughing at them. He's not mocking them. He's not rejoicing to destroy them. He's crying about it. Amen? This is not the nature of God. This is the nature of the devil. To rejoice to destroy, that's the nature of the devil. God rejoices to bless, not to kill. Okay, and then we know the same is true for Father. Jesus is the express image of Father. So if Jesus is crying about curse coming upon Jerusalem, Father is crying about curse coming up on Jerusalem. Holy Spirit is crying about curse coming upon Jerusalem. Amen. The only one that's happy about calamity and death and destruction is the devil whose will it is. Okay, then you can see in, in the majority of these passages we read, most of them had some aspect of sickness. Well, Jesus was anointed by Father with the Holy Spirit. And what was he doing? It was old covenant. They were still under the law. Okay. So under the law, Yahweh, Jehovah, said that he was responsible for every sickness and disease. Also, every sickness and every plague, which is not written in this book of the law, will the Lord bring upon you until you are destroyed. Okay. So he claims responsibility for absolutely every sickness, every plague, every ailment. He, the, the Lord claims responsibility for it. Well, it says in the New Testament that Jesus was healing people oppressed by the devil. Okay, and when when Jesus was doing all this healing, it was still Old Covenant. It was still the law. You know, so you can't wiggle your way out of it and say, well, this was something pertaining to the law. No, no, no. When Jesus was healing all these people in the Old Covenant, they were not oppressed by God. They were oppressed by the devil. Amen? So anywhere you see that somebody's being made sick, it's the devil who does it. The devil has the power of sickness. So all these sickness passages, they absolutely vehemently contradict with Acts 10.38 and many other passages. Okay? We could look at Galatians 3.13. Look at the works of Jesus. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. 
having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Okay, so Jesus, he's not, he's crying about curse. He's weeping over curse coming upon Jerusalem. He's upset about it. He wants to rescue people. When you look at the words here, Christ has redeemed. That word redeemed is more properly tr translated as ransomed. So if you go study the Greek word in chapter 3 of Galatians and chapter 4 of Galatians and, and Colossians, you're going to find this word redeemed. Okay, it really means to ransom. When you ransom somebody, when you pay a ransom payment, you pay it to an evil person. Somebody has taken a hostage. An evil person has taken a hostage. You pay a ransom so the evil person will release the hostage. Okay, that's what a ransom is, a payment to an evil person to receive a person back. Jesus was ransoming us, you know, out from under curse and law. He was ransoming, ransoming us from curse. He's not the author. He's not ransoming us from Father God. He's not ransoming us from himself. It's not kingdom divided. Jesus is, came to this earth to, to destroy the works of the devil. Jesus came to set us free from oppression of the devil. Jesus is redeeming us from the curse. The curse is of the devil. He's ransoming us from the devil and the devil's curses. Amen? So Jesus' works tell us he's not the one responsible for all these curse and calamity, death and destruction and sickness and disease. He's the answer to it. He came to this earth to set us free from the devil's oppression. Okay, and that's 1 John 3, 8. Okay, then from a perspective of death, Hebrews 2, 14. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself, Jesus, likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. Okay, when well all these passages, all this death and destruction, it's not by the power of God. It is by the power of the devil. And Jesus was sent to destroy him. So the power of death and sickness, we just see in Acts 10.38 and Hebrews 2.14, that power, it belongs to the devil. So all these passages talking about, you know, the Lord, you know, going to smite you with sickness, disease, death, and destruction. That's not, that's not Father God doing those things. It's not Jesus doing those things. It's the devil doing those things. Okay, the New Testament truths that we have in our hand, they are the truth, and we measure everything by those truths. Okay, John 10.10 10 also agrees with that. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Okay, and I could add to this list a million other scriptures, but you can see there's an absolute contradiction between Old Testament and New Testament. So why is that? Well, we're out of time for today, but the reason is because there's a veil over the Old Testament. And that veil is real. And let me just give you a teaser for next time. So we're going to look at, um, we're going to go in depth, but we're going to look at a couple of passages. And if somebody is doubting that there's a veil over the Old Testament, just read these two passages right here. They're both the same account. Um, one was hundreds of years after the other one. So in 2 Samuel chapter 24, verses 1 uh, onwards, Again, the anger of the Lord, the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel and he moved David against them to say, go number Israel and Judah. Okay. It says the Lord, the anger of the Lord, Lord. Okay. Well, hundreds of years later in first Chronicles 21, one to 14. Now Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel so the Lord sent a plague upon Israel and 70,000 men of Israel fell. This is the same passage. Like we're going to read the entire passage, but it's the same event. In one event, the Lord was called Lord. In the other event, the Lord was called Satan. Oops. So for anybody who thinks I'm crazy talking about there's a veil over the Old Testament, we're going to look at more and more examples like this. And we're going to go through this in detail. Um, so there is a veil over the Old Testament. When you read it verbatim, you guaranteed to have a wrong understanding because your mind is blinded. Your mind is blinded until this day when you read the Old Testament. Even to this day, today, right now, when you read Moses, the first five books of the Bible, 
or if you just read the Old Testament in general, when you read that, a veil is on your heart, your mind is blinded, and you cannot see God clearly. And so here you can see the flip-flopping between Lord and Satan. And go read your own Bible. <laughs> go take a look, get, screenshot this, go look up these passages in your own Bible, read the entire passage, and you're going to see that I'm not crazy, but when the Holy Spirit said there's a veil, he's serious. And so that means we must rightly divide or we will absolutely guarantee to have a wrong concept of who God is. And our faith and our love will be hindered. Amen.